Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built. And this week we are gonna get the windows into the car and then hopefully get onto the suspension. I know I said that last week, but this week I really mean it. All right guys, welcome back. And those watching last week saw that I spent almost four days just putting together the two front doors. Um, if you missed it, I'll put a link up above like always. And uh, please like, subscribe, hit the uh, notification bell. It des definitely helps the channel out. So uh, yes, last week there was a lots of messing around with electric windows and stuff. There is something going on with that passenger side. It could be the motor itself or something. It just seems to be struggling a lot more than it really should. Um, I may end up replacing that uh, that unit. I'll just uh, play around with it. The driver's door seems to be working perfectly straight away, first up, and uh, and didn't take much time. So today, um, I finally have the back window back from the window tinters. Um, if you watched a couple of episodes ago when I spent, I think, about six hours total trying to tint this one window uh, and four goes and wasting a lot of film and... Um, and just really struggling, I dropped it off to the uh, to the to the window tinters um, with the tint that they're actually right next door to my day job as a firefighter. Uh, there's a window tinting place right next door to the station, and uh, yeah, it was extremely cheap. It cost me almost nothing <laughs> to get this done professionally, perfectly, and it's back and it's ready to go. So, just sometimes it is worth paying somebody the to, to do things the right way, but I am, I've not given up. I'm gonna have another go on Harry later on. Uh, I think that window might be a little bit easier and also in the car, apparently be easier. I'm, I haven't completely given up, but uh, yeah, it was frustrating after seeing how cheap it was to get somebody to do it when I supplied the film. And, uh, anyway, moving on. Um, we have to start assembling these windows. Now, one of the first things I need to do is that I've got all these trims for the windows. These are the factory original trims. They're all sort of a bit oxidized and a bit uh, ugly. They're aluminium and they are really wonky. It looks like somebody, when they, uh, when they got these, they just peeled them out of the car. They're not kinked. They're just bent in all the wrong directions. So I have to go through now and try and straighten these up so that I can get them back into the car. Um, I think uh, from what I've heard, talking to, uh, to, to Tim, the uh, local Alpha Restorer, that the, the factory ones are better still than the, the repro ones. And yeah, so I've just got to spend some time now, try and straighten these out nicely without kinking them. And, uh, and then we we'll see if we can assemble these windows and get them in the car. So you can see here I use an old lump of wood in the vise with a slot cut in it so that I could manipulate the window trim and just bend it uh, around something nice and solid. Uh, worked quite well actually. So once the window rubber was on, it's just a slow, tedious process of going backwards and forwards and bending slightly each time the aluminium trim until it sat perfectly onto the window. So I love having these uh, old cars. This windscreen I actually ordered um, not long ago and uh, got a brand new windscreen. I think it cost me $180. Compare that to any new car, it was unbelievable. And it was, it was here in two days. It was, uh, yeah, I was very impressed. So uh, brand new windscreen, I fitted the rubber on it. And uh, like I showed you, these trims are all mangled. What I did is I got a, uh, a block of wood. Um, as you saw, I just cut a slot into it so that the, uh, the, the clip piece on the back can sit in there and then I can just manipulate it and, uh, and I'm just going backwards and forwards and laying it over the top of the rubber that I've got there just so that um, I can get the shape right uh, because you really want it to sit as perfect as possible before we clip it in because otherwise it always just tends to want to 
lift out. So um, that is looking good, just taking my time. What I might do now is now I've got it close, I'll polish it up, so then um, I'm sure when I polish it, it's gonna move. So uh, once this is uh, all polished, then I can fine tune it, clip it in, and hopefully that's the way it stays. So I quickly gave up trying to buff the trim because the clear anodizing that was on there was old and worn and just did not look good and could not be polished up. So now I'm going through with some 320 grit sandpaper and sanding off all of that anodizing before I start hitting it now with some aluminium polish and it's really coming up a treat. So now the trim is all in the right shape and polished up, it's time to fit it to the windows themselves. Clipping it into the rubber, it just takes a bit of time and, uh, and sort of <laughs> a bit of uh, finger strength, but uh, it's uh, come out quite nice in the end. All right, well that was not too bad. It just uh, took quite a bit of time because these aluminium trims, uh, they were actually anodized from the factory and um, now 50 years later the uh, the anodizing is uh, is pitted and, and horrible and you couldn't bring it back so I had to sand the anodizing off and then polish them up they will then require polishing once a year give them a quick buff up and they'll because uh, uh, they will oxidize but uh, um, that is looking okay uh, not amazing but uh, they look okay and um, what I only found is I only have three of these little, um, these are little joiners that basically just sort of slide over the top of um, the, where, where either side joins in on the win windows and uh, I need four because I need two for the front and two for the rear. So uh, now I'm going to just make one out of some aluminium and, uh, and see how that one goes. So uh, let's see if we can do something with that. So I started by roughly cutting the correct width and cleaning up the edges of the aluminium trim and now I'm going through and putting my two bends in it. Trim off the excess and then I'll sort of manipulate it by hand to get the exact right shape. So there we go, there's my little uh, piece, just a little piece of aluminium that I've bent up uh, that should do the job. Where is it? Uh, and here's an unpolished uh, stainless one. So the stainless one's a little bit thinner, but uh, this will do the job. So let's place it on and we can call the windscreen setup ready to install. Let's get the rear window to the same point. All right, the rubber and the trim is on the windows and now both front and rear windows are ready to install. Now, before I get flooded with the comments that you're doing it wrong um, and you're supposed to put the trim in afterwards, uh, you're not. Now on uh, 911 and uh, these windows, the trim, basically the order is as I've done it. So you prepare the glass, you put the rubber on the glass, you put the trim in the glass, and then you install the glass into the car. Now, apparently on cars like Minis, you, uh, you install this trim afterwards. You are not getting this trim in once it's in the, uh, in the window. You just, you just won't. This is, this is the way it's designed to go. So, um, yes, before there are comments, because there always seems to be. When I did the 911, same comments. And trust me, this is the way it's supposed to be done. We're ready to go, so uh, now it's time to flip it over and put the string in, and uh, I'll show you how we actually put it in the car. So like I said, I've done a bunch of these old style windows now, and uh, as much as I dislike them, um, I 
have a bit of an idea of what I need to do to do them. Um, one great tip is to get um, some uh, like silicon tubes, corking tubes, whatever you want to call them, uh, the nozzle for one of them. One of these things is super handy. Is uh, what you need to get yourself is get yourself some string, um, sort of some some reasonably solid string, and um, we want to run this inside the bead all the way around so that when we stick the window in, um, you can pull the string and it will peel the lip over the um, uh, the aperture in the car and you, you get it into place. Using one of these makes life much easier, helps you sort of feed it in um, and uh, I'll show you now. Start and finish at the bottom of the windscreen. I don't actually have a piece of string long enough so I'm going to use two but I'll still be starting from the bottom. Because of gravity it helps sort of the, the screen will sit down nicely. If you start at the top you'll end up just keep pulling it out. So uh, yeah, so always start at the bottom and then work your way up and uh, should be good. So normally there's one piece of string, but in this case there's two. So I start and go in one direction, and then when I start the second string, you overlap the first uh, and go in, in the opposite direction. So they go around and meet and then overlap again at the top. Now just going around and cleaning up all of the edges from where I put the headlining in, getting it all ready for the glass. I thought I'd have a bit of a go by myself, but uh, yeah, I really struggled uh, getting it with no one else to sort of hold it from the outside. You sort of need someone to put some pressure on the outside, sort of keep the edges that you've already done in and uh, stop from moving. So I enlisted the help of Mrs. Jeff, who's sort of climbed into the car and um, trying to do it. But being so high up, you can't really get good pressure on the window and you really need sort of two people on the outside and one on the inside to, to really make an easy job of it. <sighs> That was three, four, five goes at getting it in. And it's very difficult because uh, the car's very high, so it's hard to get pressure on the window. And you need to sort of be able to hold it in so that the whole lot's in. Once, as you're getting it in, getting one corner in or another corner in, um, the other side will pop out and it just it just ends up being a headache. It's quite a... Uh, it's quite a fiddly thing putting these windows in and really having um, even even three people is really handy to be able to sort of get hands on in multiple directions. I've made quite a mess of the leather there, but that'll all clean up. Um, but yeah, I think for now we're going to leave it and uh, I think we'll move on to something else and leave the windows until I can get some assistance to uh, try and get them mounted into the car properly. And this is the diff for the Alfa Ferrari. Now, um, I'm sort of annoyed at myself that I didn't get to do it myself. This is one of the only things that I haven't done myself, that and the tint of the rear window. Um, and uh, I just didn't have, I don't have presses big enough and I don't have the information on doing what I need to do and the experience. So this is the original factory limited slip diff out of the Alfa. And basically standard, it has um, a clutch plate either side uh, in the car. Now, obviously, this is old. The clutch plates were more than likely quite worn. And what I got done was I got those clutch plates replaced and actually I got two of them on either side. So it has firmed it up quite a lot. So it was actually in good, good condition. Um, and now they both ends spin the, uh, the same direction and uh, it will still have slip in it. It will still be able to go around corners without chirping the tires and stuff. It'll just be much tighter than the uh, than standard. So that is a good thing. And um, from all the comments, yes, this is more than strong enough. Uh, every Alpha guy um, has said that there is no issues with, with running this. It's more than capable of handling the uh, power of Ferrari engine. So a lot of you might have seen back a while ago when I put this in the car, I actually converted it to using a pan hard rod. And uh, that's what this sort of big contraption on the side here is. Um, that is basically lowering the roll centre of the car. I'll put a link up above for those who uh, who missed why I did what I did and and uh, and all the rest of it. But there was uh, there's method to my madness. And 
I've added the pan hard rob, but in my case, what I'm doing is I am still gonna be keeping the factory trunnion arm. So this is how the car was originally run, and basically this trunnion arm links onto the diff, and basically what this does is this is the top link uh, so that it keeps the diff uh, from tipping forwards or backwards out of, uh, out of alignment. It's, this holds it from the top. It's got the trailing arms on either side that hold it at the bottom, so it's sort of triangulated. But this also uh, was bolted on the end to stop the diff from moving side to side in the car. That's what kept it located. I am no longer going to be using it for that part. This is going to be used to stop the diff going rocking forwards and backwards. But from side to side, I'm going to let this linkage move. And the way I'm going to do that, what I've actually done is I've had this spherical bearing machined and pressed into it and a, a grease nipple on it so that basically this can keep lubricated. And what I'm going to be using is a bronze bush in between so that this can actually locate onto the uh, center of the diff and still have a bit of sideways movement. Now there's not gonna be a huge amount of sideways movement as it is. The pan hard rod is, stops it from moving side to side. The only movement is going to be really in the travel. As you travel up and down, there is a very small amount of sideways movement, but it is tiny. It's a tiny amount really. Um, on the small amount of travel of, of that arm, it's, it's a very small amount. I've got myself a bronze bush, but I actually ordered the wrong size. Uh, it was difficult to get anyway, so I'm going to now go onto the lathe and just machine this down. It's just a tiny, tiny bit out. I need to get this bronze bush onto this shaft here and then also get it so it can fit inside uh, my spherical bearing. At the moment, it's a one inch bearing and it's a one inch bush and the uh, the it's far too tight, so I need to just take it down a little bit on the lathe, and then we can install the bushing and uh, the trunnion arm in, and we have a working pan hard rod. So I start with the easy part, just turning out the inside of the bushing, just getting it to the right measurement. Not too difficult a task. Now I'm making a couple of pieces to be able to hold the bushing so that I can actually turn down the entire outside of it, adding a very slight two degree taper to each of the pieces. This has given me now a piece on either end, giving a wedge fit into the bushing. So I spent ages trying to work out how I was going to machine the entire length of the bushing because obviously I couldn't clamp it in the chuck. So what I did is I went through and I uh, just used a bit of uh, bar stock I had lying around and uh, turned a couple of tapers into either end. Just a really fine taper so it wedge fits in either end, these two pieces. And then uh, I used the dial indicator to get it so it's uh, spinning nice and true. But uh, interestingly, this uh, machine bronze bushing that's supposed to be exact dimensions actually tapers. Um, I don't believe it's my machine. I th I'm pretty sure it's the, uh, the bushing. So this is what I was all about. So you can see that with that bearing in the, um, uh, in the trunnion arm, the suspension go up either side. It can also go side to side uh, as the suspension travels up and down. So it has uh, a full range of movement while still being captive forward and, and aft. So now that should be a fully working setup for the pan hard rod. So now I need to go through and start reassembling the uh, the brake lines and bits and pieces so that I can get a handbrake in the car because I definitely need the handbrake to work for the show. All right, so I bolted on the nice new rear discs and the C12 racing calipers, these custom four pot rears and six pot fronts. Um, you should. Check out uh, Chris C12 Racing on Instagram. He's, uh, he's actually custom building his own car to an insane level. Uh, well worth checking out. Thanks again, Chris. Now I'm gonna make new brake lines for the diff because the old ones are crusty and uh, yeah, um, I've got new brake lines everywhere else. New brake lines are a must.
<laughs> All right, so just a quick word on making up brake lines. I really like this style of bench um, brake line tool. I do actually have a uh, uh, another one that I can actually do when it's in the car, because sometimes you just have no choice but to do uh, a fitting in the car, which is a similar style to this. But this one, it just makes it so easy. I've some, used some of the really cheap, junky ones before, and they're horrible. This one, you... It's really easy to use. Uh, I got it through Raceworks and it's just great. And another tip, uh, anyone who's ever done brake lines before will know that uh, don't forget to put the, uh, the brake line on, uh, the brake fitting on before you crimp. Because uh, you will, we all do it. You'll do this perfect crimp and then uh, it comes off. But yeah, this uh, bench style does a beautiful flare every time. This is a, uh, a bubble flare. Uh, that just so, so simple. Um, and this particular line, because I've got different brakes to the, uh, the fitting on the inside, there's slightly different fittings. One end has a bubble flare, the other one has a, um, uh, a 37 degree uh, cone flare. So we'll go through and do that now. And um, yeah, and then we can fit this diff into the car. So first you use Operation Zero, which is just a flat end just to get the length of brake line at the right spot in the jaws, then tighten it up. Then I use operation one, which sort of gives it a little bit of a flare on the end of it. And then um, in this case, uh, because I'm doing a tapered fit, I go through operation two and it goes back and just gives a very nice taper. And it's that easy, super quick, super easy, perfect flare every time. It's so nice to actually have the Alpha off of the frame that it's been sitting on for the last who knows how long, uh, and uh, and for good. I've dismantled the frame, it's, uh, it's out of here, so now this car is not going back on the ground until it's sitting on its own wheels, which is great. So uh, now I have the diff prepped up, it's time to start bolting it all into place. So I start by greasing up the bushing and the connection to the trunnion arm and I can bolt it on for good with a nice new cotter pin on it. Now I'm going through and replacing the bushings on the trailing arms. Um, they're a bit of a pain to, to do but uh, got them out okay. And next is bolting everything in. So start with the trunnion arm. Having a hoist definitely makes life much, much easier. Both trailing arms in and then the panhard rod, getting everything nice and centered. Now I'm pulling apart the old limiting straps to salvage the hardware. This is one of the best garage hacks I saw a long time ago on another video is having the bench grinder clipped underneath the bench on hinges so you can just flip it out it's already wired up and powered up i just have to flip it out turn it on off i go and then just fold it away again when i'm done fantastic hack So you can see I've gone through now, I've fitted some nice new limiting straps and some new bump stops. Uh, that's how they work in this old Alpha, just uh, that stops the, uh, limits the downward travel. So now I need to get on and connect up these things, which are my handbrake with a nice new handbrake cable. And uh, then we can actually stop the car from rolling down the hill. All right, 
I have a working handbrake, although because I've raised the handbrake up, it is on a bit of a weird angle coming out of the, uh, uh, the cables on a bit of an angle there. Um, not the end of the world, but uh, not ideal. And the handbrake is now working. Woohoo! Wow, <laughs> looking at this thing now, almost at ride height, I forgot how small this car is because it's been up on the frame for so long. It's sitting up high. I, I just, I, I forget that this is just such a little car. It's, 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 it's only tiny and it's probably sits lower than this when it's on its wheels. Uh, yeah, it is really a little car and uh, yeah, I am, oh, I, I'm, I'm beginning to taste it. But I'm also noticing now that it's down off the frame how filthy dirty it is. I'm really looking forward to uh, when I can eventually get that glass in properly, uh, giving it a good wash. Now it's down low, I can uh, hopefully uh, get onto doing that glass in the next week or so, uh, maybe on or off camera, but uh, it's such a headache, but we'll get there. The div is in, I'm very happy. Uh, handbrake is working, so a lot of it's done. Um, springs and shocks are coming. I've got something special coming for that. I will uh, um, fill you guys in when that all gets here. So um, for now, I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hi guys. In 2005, Ferrari's entry into Formula One was essentially an evolution of the previous year's championship winning car. After five consecutive driver championships and six constructors, Ferrari is fairly confident going into that year's championships. However, a major change in the FIA rules put pay to that. 2005 was the year when cars could only use one set of tyres for the entire race and pit stops were only to be used for fuel. The absolute opposite of today. There were also two different tyre manufacturers, with most of the field using Michelin, but Ferrari, along with Jordan and Minardi, using Bridgestones. Now, the Bridgestone tyres proved to be less competitive against the Michelins, and Ferrari struggled as a result all year. The best result all year came at a US Grand Prix in Indianapolis, where the high-speed corner, 13, proved to cause too much wear on the Michelins, meaning they could only last for around 10 laps. A last minute plea from Michelin to add a chicane was rejected by the FIA, as it would be unfair for the Bridgestone shod cars. As a result, 14 of the cars did not compete in the race for safety reasons. Michael Schumacher and Rubens Barrichello came in first and second for Ferrari in that race. That year, Fernando Alonso in his Renault went on to break Ferrari's winning streak, taking out his and Renault's first Formula One World Championship. Oh, I'm excited. It, seeing it on the ground now, like low and actually, yeah, it's, it's, it definitely feels like it's coming together and it's nice to actually get back to doing just some sort of basically mechanical stuff. And that's um, going to make it a lot easier to put the windows in. So much easier. So much now easier. that we can actually get over and, and put some pressure on. Because it's very hard to put pressure on, but you're like, like that. Yeah, I can, well, you can get this right down and, yeah, it's just, it's, it's very difficult to uh, uh, get those windows in, but uh, But why we'll start it, it the easy way when you can do it the hard way first? That's right. Multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Like, subscribe, let Jeff know what you think about the videos. Follow him on Patreon if you want to help him out. And uh, we'll any other things? See you on the next one. Only, uh, what, four more weeks to go after this, I think. So it's getting down to crunch time. Crunch time. See you guys. Bye. Ferrari's entry into the Formula One. Yes, but it's not the Formula One. Entry into Formula One. To the Formula One. <laughs> On the internet, the Facebook now. <laughs> 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 On the interweb. With a high-speed corner 13, proved to provide too much wear <laughs> on the Michelins. The US Grand Prix in Michelin, <laughs> because the high-speed corner, 13, proved to give too much wear. No. Okay, stop, stop, don't look at me. <laughs> All right. Provided too much wear on the no, Michelin. Provided. <laughs> caused. Caused, is proved to, proved to cause. Winning first place, his first time, and Renault's first time in a Grand Prix Championship. No. Formula One World Championship. Yes. Oops. His and Renault's first World Championship Formula One. Formula One World Championship. Sounds weird saying World Championship. It does sound weird. Taking out his and Renault's first championship. Formula One World Championship. 
<laughs> Taking out his and Renault's first world championship, Formula One. Formula One world championship. Okay. <laughs> Yay! <laughs>